How's everyone doing? Good? You having a good time? Yes. Right. Let's, let's keep that up. Blockchain technology for financial institutions. What does that mean? What kinds of projects are financial institutions doing? Why are they doing these projects? Why are these projects valuable? And what kinds of things should we expect in the future? Okay, so that's basically the topic of my talk. So I work for Capgemini Financial Services, so my clients are banks and insurers. I will be talking about it mainly from that perspective, but I do think a lot of the things I'm saying here you might be able to apply to other kinds of industries. So let's start with a question. Who here has been following Bitcoin intensely since before 2014? Please raise your hand. Okay, that's very few people. There may be a few people who don't want to raise their hand for certain kinds of reasons, but it's not very many people. So, I started following Bitcoin closely in spring of 2013. Now, I've come across Bitcoin quite a few times in the years preceding, uh, but I never understood what on earth it was about. So, I thought it was something like PayPal or a credit card. Oh, it wasn't really interesting. It wasn't really registered. But then at some point, I come across it quite a few times, and you know, I kept on seeing this price going up. I was like, what on earth is this thing about which is now so expensive? Time it was $140, so relatively speaking, today right? hey, it wasn't all that expensive. But I didn't know that they so this is when I really started following Bitcoin, sort of. Thing. Now, it was about for those of you who were around at the time. This was about, I would say, maybe a year or a year and a half before we started getting this idea of blockchain technology for banks, for financial institutions. And that started about a year and a half after the last started. And the idea was something like this. So we have this really cool thing called Bitcoin. The real innovation behind it is the blockchain. The blockchain, you can build all kinds of other applications. You can build stock markets, bond markets. You can register property on it. You can you know, manage supply chains with it and all kinds of different things. In fact, in about 2000 is when people started to make lists, right? And then somebody would come up with a list of about 80 things and then somebody else would outdo them and think of 90 and then 100 and it just kind of became this competition. <coughs> so this was kind of the general idea, right? So Bitcoin was generally presented as the light bulb and the blockchain was presented as electricity, right? Now, I've been in Bitcoin for a while, so you know, I had a reasonable grasp on how, how Bitcoin worked, but I didn't really understand the slogan. The slogan didn't make much sense to me. So what technology are people specifically talking about? It didn't make much sense to me. But luckily, I, you know, I'm from the Netherlands, and I was surrounded by a Bitcoin community in the Netherlands with very intelligent people who explained to me, Jan, it's not you. It's a slogan. Normally I have these kinds of experiences with ex-girlfriends, but sometimes I also have them with new technologies. What's wrong with the slogan? What's wrong with the slogan is this. It is Bitcoin itself that is the innovation. Bitcoin itself, the system itself, is the innovation. So it's kind of like this. When I was younger, I had all these boxes full. And, you know, maybe I wanted to build a castle, but I was never able to do it. All the pieces were there, I just was never able to do it. Didn't know how to get the tower quite right, didn't know how to get the drawbridge quite right. Uh, but one day I discovered finally how to do it. Bitcoin is a lot like that. The pieces were already there. It's just that people didn't realize how to put it together. And it's finally Satoshi Nakamoto, which puts this stuff together. Now, if you want to talk about some very specific aspect, maybe, of Bitcoin, which is most innovative, you inevitably have to say that that's proof of work mining. Most well, certainly, and I heard proof of stake already, that's a complete long story. So, if you want to read about that stuff, you know, read Andrew Bullstrap, Paul Storch, I mean, this, this, this stuff has been discussed. 
this is just, to me, this is just a non starter. I, I don't understand why people are still talking about this. Sorry, I'm, I'm pretty, I, I'm pretty big on this stuff. All right. Um, so, but that's also not what you know blockchain technology for enterprises means, right? So, in in, in my own office in Utrecht, we have you know, sort of the Capgemini laboratory, and we have a few miners uh, sitting there. But that's just to show the clients, right? It's all like financial institutions or building mining institutions, right? So, what does blockchain technology for financial institutions mean exactly? <laughs> In order to understand it, you have to drop this slogan that is in technology behind Bitcoin. Well, we're not going to learn about it because the clicker doesn't work. So. Let's, let's drop the technology for a second. Because banks and insurers and enterprises in general don't care so much about technology. If you're a startup, here's a little secret. When you go and you try to sell your product and push your product, with a bank or an insurer, don't talk about smart contracts, mining, and all this kind of stuff. Explain to them what problem you are going to solve. What is the value proposition that you have? So let's ignore the technology for the time being, and let's talk about the kinds of things that financial institutions would like to do in terms of innovation. What kinds of things would they like to do in terms of innovation? Now, there's a lot of different things banks and insurers might want to do in terms of innovation, but I think this list is probably a pretty good list of the kinds of priorities that they have. First of all, and I think this is a really big one, reduction of reconciliation burden. What, did that, what does that mean? So, if you look at the financial IT let's there's all these different systems sort of operating all across the world, and they're constantly sending each other messages. And if at any point in time, one system interprets that message in a way which wasn't intended, that causes a huge problem. So imagine, for instance, you know, you're a bank and you just bought three million worth of bonds, but in communicating to your treasury department, the system there accidentally interprets it at 30 million bonds. Not three, but three to thirty. That's a huge problem for your capital and, and liquidity management, and it also costs a lot of time to figure out what actually went wrong and resolve that issue. Okay, so these kinds of costs are huge for financial institutions in many kinds of contexts. Another thing that I real-time conduction of business activities. Much of the financial system does not operate in real time. So here's an example. If you're a large global bank, you will have you know, all kinds of assets spread around all over the world in different places in order to comply with you know, capital and liquidity requirements. Right? It would be really great if you could move that money around very quickly to take advantage of it. Unfortunately, you can't. Because moving this stuff around takes time, and there are oftentimes uncertainties in how long it takes for one thing to get to another place. If you can do all of this stuff in real time, that can make a huge impact. Other things, regulatory requirements. Financial institutions have a huge number of regulatory requirements. In my personal opinion, the problem with the financial system is not that we don't have enough regulatory requirements, we have far, far too many. If a financial institution does this, they're in trouble costs a lot of time and money in order to meet those. More easily established foundation for trust. In some kind of context, banks and insurers sometimes have to forego opportunities because they're interacting with a partner who they don't know very well. Okay? And they don't have a good enough basis to, to, to pursue the opportunity which is on offer. Okay? So it'd be really great if you could use technology in some way to make that foundation of trust easier to establish. Increased automation and digitalization, this is not relevant in every single context. When you're talking about you know, listed equities or something like that, those things are usually highly optimal and efficient and so on. But in some kind of context, like for instance, trade or supply chain finance or certain insurance market, this is certainly something relevant that they would like to do. Finally, new business models. So these institutions are looking for new kinds of ways to generate revenues. So when you think about some of the traditional kinds of products, so something like consumer payments, 
um, that isn't as profitable as it used to be, right? So they're always kind of looking for new, new business models and new ways to generate them. Okay, so when you look at the list of priorities of what banks and insurers want, this is probably not complete, but I think this is a reasonably complete list of what they're Let's now think about blockchain technology. Because I told you, it doesn't mean blockchains, strictly speaking, the Bitcoin kind of thing. Okay, so we have to make a clear distinction between two things. On the one hand, we have open systems like Bitcoin, which have mining, cryptocurrency that incentivizes the system in the right way, uh, transactions, there needs to be network-wide consensus, if you want to change the rules, there has to be community consensus, and so on and so on. This is a story that was just given to you by Jonathan. That's not what financial institutions are talking about when they're talking about blockchain technology. What they're talking about are permissioned ledger systems. What is a permissioned ledger system? It's basically a closed system people need permissions in order to play a certain role in that system. You don't need any money. You don't need a cryptocurrency. And the kinds of consensus that you see is very different. So usually it's not network-wide consensus that you need, but consensus, you know, on the agreement of a certain state of a transaction between the relevant parties. So if you think about this in the context of payments, bank A to bank B, you know, it, it would be something like Bank A, Bank B, and maybe the central bank have to agree that this is the transaction that we did, we all digitally sign it, and this is what we store. Okay, I can't, I can't describe a note, this is kind of a rough description, you could probably have an extent, you know, you can have a very extensive discussion about the exact difference, but this is the broad difference. And these are two very different things. They're technically different things, but they're also intending to solve very different kinds of problems. Um, oftentimes, so this is generally what financial institutions mean with, when they're talking about blockchain technology. Usually that discussion about permission ledger systems uh, is accompanied by discussions about you know, all kinds of related ideas and techniques and concepts. Um, so usually in this kinds of discussion, you know, you'll also be talking about peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, program of money is a, is, a, is, a, is a concept which gets thrown, a lot, uh, thrown around a lot. Uh, and smart contracts. But not smart contracts. Who here has read Nick Zembo? Anybody read Nick Zembo? Two people raised their hand. Okay, very good. Everybody needs to read Nick Zembo on smart contracts. In any case, these are not the kinds of smart contracts financial institutions are talking about. Okay, so Nick Zembo has this pretty cool idea about smart contracts. That's not what I'm talking about. What banks, uh, what financial institutions mean is they're basically talking about transactions which have you know, highly automated business and contractual logic in terms of implementing it, and in terms of storing it, and in terms of it. Okay. I've talked to you, you know, given sort of a general description of the kinds of things that financial institutions would like to witness, right? Um, maybe not a complete list, but a pretty illustrative list. I've explained to you what is meant by blockchain technology in the context of financial institutions, which is basically this idea of a permission ledger. So then the question is, well, what does a shared ledger contribute to... How do I... Uh, so basically the question is, what does a shared ledger contribute to this list? Right? Okay, it's basically the following. I think you can sum it up in one statement. What the shared ledger does, it helps build a more reliable, common view on business interactions. That's the essential point of why financial institutions want to use shared ledger. What does that mean? I, I, so, okay, let's take an example, right? Let's say you're talking about this in the context of contract uh, between two parties, and um, you know, there's sort of, uh, there's a state of this contract, and then the state of the contract gets updated, and this sort of goes back and forth on a shared ledger, and they keep track of this. 
Um, it, it's not that the, let's say if there was business data associated with this contract, it's not that the business data is any more reliable. That's not what a shared ledger does. It just helps build a better view of what we actually did historically with each other. How we interact. Okay. Let's see. Can somebody grab me some water, by the way? It's quite, quite warm in here. <laughs> Maybe I'm just getting too excited talking uh, talking. All right, so, so what does this do, right? What, how does this, how does, how, what does this do in terms of the list we were talking about before? Well, here's one thing. Remember I was talking about those breaks in the systems when one, you know, one IT system thought something different happened than another IT system? That kind of problem is less likely to occur and much easier to resolve when it does happen. So that's a big one. Um, reduction of counterpart risk. So sometimes, Great service here in France. We don't have, we don't have service like this in the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, reduction of counterparty risk. So that's another that's another pretty big deal, right? Uh, regulatory compliance. In some kinds of cases, a shared ledger system can help with regulatory compliance, and in some kinds of cases, it can also help with fraud minimization. Now, again, this list is probably not entirely complete, but this is the essential item. Okay. By the way, this, this comes from the future of financial uh, infrastructure, although I changed it a little bit because I don't think it's entirely accurate. I think my question is better. Okay, so that's all still on a pretty high level. So let's try to get an idea of one of these projects. Like what, what does this actually look like? What, what happens in the wild? Right? All right, but before I introduce that project, I'd like to make one key. So when you're reading in the newspaper that you know, a group of banks or something is doing a project with blockchain technology, blockchain technology is never the only thing that they're doing. In fact, these projects, they're doing a lot of different things, and the idea of a shared ledger is really only one part of that project. So in many of these kinds of projects, for instance, a big challenge is assembling ecosystems getting different parties to work together and to agree to certain kinds of rules of governance for a new kind of platform. It's oftentimes about finding ways to manage regulatory frameworks in better ways that don't have so much to do with technology. Oftentimes in these projects, there is a very intense look at business models and looking at ways that business models can be refined, particularly in the light of new technology. <coughs> Next, there's the use of the technology toolbox. Now, that it's never only a shared ledger concept, right? It's not just about the shared ledger. In fact, there's all kinds of technologies that, that will take advantage of in these projects. Peer-to-peer -peer networks, public key infrastructures, all these kinds of things. Plus, times it's about operational improvements, right? Things like, okay, this is taking uh, 500 different steps. Can we do this in 100 steps kind of thing? Uh, lots of times about change management, right? So if you're building applications for insurers and banks, one of the ways in which those applications, you know, one of the things you need in order for that to be successful is you need people to actually use it, right? So you need to teach them how to use it, so that's a big one. Integration into existing environments. This is also that's a huge challenge, right? So now you've built this great application, and now you've actually got to put it in, and, and make it connect to all these legacy systems in the sound way. This is one of the reasons why Capgemini works with a lot of startups, because Capgemini is particularly good at this stuff, integrating into legacy systems. Because we build them, so it's pretty familiar. Okay, so this is a big background. So let's now look at one of these projects to get an idea of what this stuff looks like. So I can't mention client names. All I can say is that this concerns a Particularly consort, particular consortium in a European country. This is a project that we just, uh, that we just completed. Um, what's the situation? Well, basically concerns a market for the insur insurance of commercial and casualty insurance. So, um, you know, let's say you have a big company like uh, Carrefour, right, in France. They might have, I don't know, 2,000 two buildings or something, right? Well, they need to be insured against you know, fires, floods, somebody slips and falls on the floor and breaks their leg, right? You need insurance against that. So that's, this is what this market is. Okay. 
And in this market, most of these contracts happen through brokers. So clients don't approach the insurers directly. Instead, they approach a broker who advises them and negotiates on their behalf. Now, the way this marketplace operated was pretty traditional. So most of these kinds of negotiations took place by email, sometimes physical meetings, emails, a lot of them. There, would, there are some, there's a little bit of automation. All right, so what is the main problem in this ecosystem? These negotiation processes take a really long time. And usually brokers are negotiating with, let's say, five or six different insurers, maybe. And it means that, you know, five in the end will have been negotiating for nothing and spending all the time for nothing because they're not going to get the insurance. Company. Right? So what, what is the essential problem you would like to solve here? Well, you would like to, this to go essentially in a much more efficient way. Well, why is it, well, why is it so inefficient? Um, well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, a lot of uh, data, that, so, um, but, but the main reason is the following. So uh, there are basically two steps to this process. So the first step is brokers approach insurers and ask them if they would potentially be interested in negotiating about an insurance contract. And the second is the negotiations itself. And in both phases, insurers need certain business data, right? Because you can't just insure something if you don't know what it is. Right? So you need information about the buildings and you know all, all kinds of different all kinds of different information. Um, well here, here's a big impediment. There was no agreed upon standards of what kind of information was needed to make what kind of decision. So insurers have different ideas about what kinds of information they would need in each step of that process. Um, another impediment was that a lot of this is uh, a lot of this is manual work. So insurers would get information and they have to get people to you know sort of manually uh, in input that information into their into their own systems. Um, also, what made it quite difficult that there wasn't uh, you know sometimes difficult there isn't you know some select channel of communication uh, for, for all of this that works very well. So that also creates some inefficiencies. All right. So, what did we do? Um, well, let me first give you an idea of what the solution, uh, well, I shouldn't say the entire solution, because we're still building it. We just finished the prototype. So this is what the prototype looks like. So the base, well, it's a bit more complex than this, but this is what it looks like at the basis. Right? So at the basis, what you have is you have uh, brokers and insurers that are on a peer-to-peer -peer network with a nice public key infrastructure. Public key infrastructure, for those of you who don't know, I think Jonathan I think just said a few words about it. Um, it basically allows you to communicate securely with other, uh, with other entities. Okay? And they're sitting on this. They're sitting on this network, and so all the negotiations are now taking place on this network. Well, how are these negotiations taking place? Well, like I said, there are two phases, right? In the first phase, brokers might send out, uh, you know, a request for interest to let's say five or six different insurers. And one of the big things that we did here is we uh, found an agreement of what the basic business data set is that is needed. Right, that everybody agrees upon that is needed for making an expression of that interest. Okay. If an insurer says yes, they can either you know, say yes or no. Right, it's just binary. Then they enter into the negotiation phase. And the broker will send some, you know, will send out uh, the request again, but this time with all the data that would be needed for an insurer to make a decision, including the terms of the contract that they are seeking, right? So I want the premium to be this high, this will be my fee, that, that kind of thing. All right, well, insurers can look at that and they can say, uh, okay, I agree, and usually they don't, so, and they'll say, well, I want the premium to be slightly higher, and the fee to be slightly higher, or something like this. Okay, and that goes back and forth until eventually you have the contract. And all of this discussion happens on the basis of a shared ledger. So each time there is an interaction, 
each time there's an interaction. That's registered by both parties. And so both parties eventually will just build up this history of every single interaction that they gave in this negotiation. Every time they change something, right? Every time they propose something new. All right. So when you look at the goals of the solution for this particular project, they're quite multifaceted. Right, so the slogan we have is an efficient, transparent, secure, and easy to use platform for negotiations between brokers and insurers. And this platform needs to have, you know, meet a lot of desiderata, right? So it needs to be easy to on onboard, otherwise you get all kinds of regulatory problems, right? Antitrust, antitrust laws. You need to be able to communicate securely and store your information securely. Uh, you need to be able to query information in a really easy way. Uh, if you'd like to automate as much as possible, negotiations need to be structured, that's really one of the big things. And you would like transparent monitors. Now when you look at all these desiderata, like I said before, this is not all done by a shared measure. Right? So the secure communication and storage, that comes from the public key infrastructure and the peer-to-peer -peer network. Right? Um, the fact that there is you know, good querying of the, of the data is not necessarily done by a shared ledger, right? The structured negotiation, that has nothing to do with technology. That's a business problem, right? The business problem, you know, how, what, what standards are we all going to agree on is sufficient for these negotiations to go quicker in terms of what business data is needed. Okay. But shared ledger does offer contribution. So what is the contribution in this particular case? Um, well, Maybe multiple, but I think these four are pretty indicative. So it helps give, give the parties good confidence in the state of negotiations and where they are at and what happened in the past. If there's ever a discrepancy in what they think happened, it should be pretty easy to resolve. Um, reduction of counterparty risk that could potentially be that could potentially be interesting in this uh, in this case. Uh, not so much for the parties that are currently involved in this market because they have long-standing interactions with each other, but maybe in the future as new kinds of players want to enter into it. And good auditability. Okay. I hope this kind of gave you an overview of the kinds of projects that financial institutions are doing. If you want to know about other financial, you know, other kinds of projects, you can ask me or you can ask my friend Chris over here, who is one of my uh, one of my uh, developers. Good. All right. So, well, what about the what about the future, right? So, this is kind of what's been happening up till now. What, what, what's going to continue to happen? Well, a lot of these types of projects are most of them, in fact, are, are still in prototyping phase, right? So, very few of these things have been brought. Actually, no that I know of have been into, have brought into production level. Okay. And we're going to see, you start to see a lot more of that, right? So in 2018, I think you'll be seeing quite a few of these things coming into production and actually operating out, out in the wild. And this is going to continue. Why will this continue? Uh, well, because this is very useful to financial institutions in solving certain kinds of problems, these types of projects, right? So just think about the project I described, how drastically different the broker and insurer landscape will look once that solution is actually operating out into the wild. That will take a while because you need to think about a lot of different things, most importantly trying to integrate this with all kinds of legacy systems and so on, but eventually it's going to operate out into the wild and it's going to drastically change the way the secret system looks for the day. Right? And we're going to keep doing a lot of these kinds of projects and they're going to be particularly relevant in not so much in cases where there's a lot of automation and optimization, things like listed equities and so on, uh, but more so in areas where there isn't a lot of automation uh, yet. So in places like, uh, you know, things like trade finance, supply chain finance, certain insurance markets and so on. Okay. All right, so that's the story for blockchain technology and enterprises, and that story is going to continue. Um, However, when we look at the recent, you know, recent years, uh, financial institutions haven't really done very much with Bitcoin specifically. 
But I think the question, what about Bitcoin, is going to become much more relevant in the next few years. At least it has a chance of becoming much more relevant in the next few years. Why is that the case? Well, Jonathan already touched upon a lot of these points, but no two people ever explained the same thing and said why twice, so in that period, let me just go through the story here. The essential questions for the success of Bitcoin that you have to answer positively, positively I think are twofold. One, will the world value sound digital money? Does it value sound digital money? Second, can Bitcoin fulfill that role? What does sound digital money mean? Um, basically, some of the points that Jonathan's already touched upon, but I'll reiterate them here. Something that has a strong guarantee of scarcity. Something that enables censorship-resistant transactions. Something that protects privacy in transactions. A lot of our financial interactions aren't really all that private. Right? We're exposing a lot of data in our financial interactions. It supports financial sovereignty. So the idea that the owner of the assets is in fact in control of those assets. And finally, the idea of sound digital money, I think, is it's more transportable, more divisible, and also in some ways at least better storable than gold. Okay, so this is this idea of sound digital money. And the two questions I think you know, that you really have to ask yourself, will the world value something like this? That's one thing. Or does it value something like this? And two, can Bitcoin play that role? Now, the first question seems to be almost obviously this. Yes, the world values sound digital money. I I think there are a lot of people who would like something like this. And if you're from the traditional financial institution and your first reaction is, oh, that must be criminals, the answer is no. Go post this question in Zimbabwe or Venezuela because the people there, it's completely obvious why they would want something like this. So it really relies on the second question, right? Can Bitcoin play this? Role. And for about 30 years before Bitcoin existed, people had something of an idea of sound digital money. It's just most people involved in that were not convinced that you could actually build it. Right? So when Satoshi Nakamoto published his white paper on November 8, 2008, I think it was, when he published that, most people did not believe him. Most people thought, no, this can't, this can't work, right? Because they had 30 years of experience trying to build something like this. And well, it hadn't worked before, so it must not have never work. Well, it did at least kind of seem to work. And I think what's really relevant here is that, you know, as Bitcoin grows, <coughs> at least my personal conviction that it could potentially play that role is starting to increase. So I am more positive about Bitcoin doing this than three years ago. More positive than two years ago. In fact, more positive than, let's say, a week ago. <laughs> right? Now, there's still a chance that, you know, there's still a chance that, you know, there's still a lot of challenges for Bitcoin, technical and political challenges and so on. I'm not denying any of this. It's just that, you know, you really have to start taking the probability that this could happen pretty seriously. It's not negligible. So, all right, so why do I say this? Why do I talk about sound digital money, right? Because there's all these people who really want to buy coffee, for instance, with their Bitcoin, right? So, so what about all these other things about, you know, payments and so on? Um, I think, you know, Adam, Adam Beck, he, who knows Adam Beck? Please, please read Adam Beck, if you don't, because Adam Beck is one of the, you know, one main, main people in this space. You can follow him on Twitter. So, you know, I think he put it pretty, pretty well, um, I think it was about two weeks ago, he said, you know, Bitcoin might actually potentially go through multiple S-curves, where different kinds of uses start to come into view, and people adopt Bitcoin for that, for that purpose. 
that's potentially true. I, I, I kind of look at Bitcoin actually as a new category of thing. Right? Just like the internet was a new category of thing. And maybe there are all kinds of undiscovered you know, applications that are still out there. However, for any of this to work, open timestamping, payments for coffee, micropayments, all this kind of stuff, for any of this stuff to work, Bitcoin has to meet the condition of Sanders. Otherwise, it will not succeed. That's, that's basically my view. All right, so there's a lot of discussion about this, uh, about this as well. Um, uh, I, I like some of the, 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 the things from uh, Seyfedin uh, Amus. He's, he's, I think he discusses this pretty well. He actually has a book uh, coming, coming out, I think, in December, which is probably, probably a good read. Uh, Bitcoin, sound money for a digital age. Okay. So let's now talk for a minute about why I think this idea that Bitcoin can play that role. Why, why am I... Why do I think that probability is higher now than it was in the past? Why do I think it's not negligible? Well, there's actually a couple of reasons, but the very first one is the most important one. Decentralized governance. By governance here, I don't mean governance in a very strict sense. I mean in a very loose sense. So the rules in the Bitcoin community, or in Bitcoin, are really determined by the community. Right? And I think if anything has been shown the last year is that at least Bitcoin currently is operating in that way. So the way I see all these hard fork initiatives and all this kind of stuff, I see these things as people trying to take over Bitcoin. And I think what has you know, really proven itself to be true in the marketplace is that it's, you know, these people were not fit to take over Bitcoin. You know, I have this discussion about uh, miners as well. There was a, there was a question. Um, and, and minor centralization does worry me a little bit, but what makes me very optimistic is that even with quite a lot of mining centralization at the moment, they clearly cannot control Bitcoin, which is very good. So. There are other reasons as well. Uh, a lot of technical innovations, uh, things like the Lightning Network and MimbleWimble and Mast and a whole list of things that I can barely keep up with. Luckily, I'm surrounded by intelligent people who can tell me about these things. Um, mainstream investment opportunities. So I, I, I really think that it's only now starting to come into the mainstream purview. Bitcoin. I, I really don't think we've ever touched upon that point yet, and I think we're touching upon it now. The changing narrative. When I started in Bitcoin in 2013, you know, if you said you were interested in Bitcoin, the reaction was, oh, you must be criminal." Right? That's a standard reaction. And every single, you know, every single discussion in the newspapers was about criminals and you know, terrorists and all kinds of things. And certainly the communication has been a lot more positive in, uh, in the past year uh, or so. I still think it focuses far too much on, on price <laughs> and not the value of Bitcoin, but it's certainly a lot better than it, uh, than it ever was. Um, a very motivated community. So Bitcoin has a huge number of very idealistically motivated people who really want to build this thing and you know, change, change the world, basically, right? And this is kind of self-reinforcing. So in, in a sense, I don't care so much for, about the price, but on the other hand, it does have a lot of positive effects. Why? Because a lot of people who were in Bitcoin early are starting to get very, very rich. How are you, they're using that money? Well, some of the people, you know, they go to the Bahamas and they just lie on the beach, but some of them, they start Bitcoin companies, they start writing articles about Bitcoin, they start building products, and so on and so on. And it's kind of self-perpetuating, right? Because as the price rises, more and more people do this, which grows the value of the ecosystem, and more and more people jump in. Um, dominance in the ecosystem, uh, you know, I, I get the question still sometimes, you know, is, is it maybe another altcoin that can do this and not Bitcoin? Uh, my, my general position is uh, altcoins are temptations to be resisted, not opportunities to be seized. Uh, I, I think the dominance of Bitcoin in the entire ecosystem is blatantly and obviously present. Right? And certain social trends. So certain social trends are also kind of helping uh, Bitcoin. So here's an example. Uh, the abolishment of cash. So in a lot of societies, there's now this idea that it would be a good idea to lim eliminate all cash transactions. But what you see 
with initiatives like this is that Bitcoin grows in places where people try to do this. So India would be a good, good example. Okay, so all these reasons don't mean that Bitcoin is locked and solid and, and ready to go. That's it. Discussion over, right? So we are still. What? I, I, I haven't checked in five minutes, so I, I don't know what the price is now. But we're somewhere around the 150 billion dollar market cap. Yeah, that is peanuts when you're talking about the global financial system. Right? That's 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 still not very very big. Um, but there is a lot of momentum behind it, right? And it is and it does seem to be growing very very quickly at the moment. All right. So when you think about Bitcoin. Right? And you think about what does it mean for Bitcoin to be a success? So a lot of the narrative in the mainstream you know, media nowadays is something like, well, Bitcoin will be a new asset class. That's not just what Bitcoin is going to be. If Bitcoin is really going to be sound money in a digital age, it's going to be much more than just a new asset class. Because think about why Bitcoin was created in the first place. It was, it was created to cause massive disruption to our monetary and financial system. Right? So here are some examples. Think about capital controls in the Bitcoin world. You know, there's this law that if you go to the US and you carry more than ten thousand dollars, you you know you have to you have to declare that. But now I can just carry a long number, which is my private key, or even better, I can maybe I don't know, email it to myself if I have a secure email at least, or, or whatever, right? But it could be a hundred million billion dollars, not a billion, but a hundred million dollars in Bitcoin on there. Am I going to declare that at the, at the border? Yeah, it's going to be, I don't know. <laughs> not me, at least. <laughs> right? So, so, you know, a lot of our world works through capital controls. It's kind of, you know, what, what happens when Bitcoin becomes successful? Regulatory frameworks, right? So since the 1970s, since Nixon, um, we've been basically building our financial system around this idea of know your customer and anti-money laundering legislation, right? Uh, which, you know, has certain ends that, that, that may be valuable. On the other hand, it's also had implications for our privacy. So, if Bitcoin becomes a really a success, in order for it to become a real success, it, it has to be anonymous, because otherwise Bitcoin probably couldn't be a success if it's not. And especially if you, you know, if, what, what I think you're starting to see is that Bitcoin is kind of also developing a parallel economy. So if, if, if Bitcoin isn't really interacting very much with the financial system, if there's a lot of anonymity within the transactions itself, you know, how, how, does, that, how does that change the world? Right? Pretty, pretty substantial. Um, third, uh, the idea of a peer-to-peer -peer world. Right? So I think Bitcoin is, is one innovation in sort of a larger set of innovations where it seems like what we're doing in the digital sphere is moving away from using intermediaries in the digital sphere but interacting in a peer-to-peer -peer way. Bitcoin might have been the first in that step. Bitcoin might be an important second step. And maybe the next step is something like identity. Right? Um, if you're interested in that kind of thing, my friend uh, Tim, Tim Pastor uh, writes about this kind of stuff, and I think it's a pretty good job. Uh, another idea which is pretty interesting is machines which you can have bank accounts. I mean, that, that seems feasible with Bitcoin. Uh, you know, what, what does that mean <laughs> for the world, right? So the world's going to pretty drastically change. Uh, I think uh, Jonathan already mentioned the concept of a, of a DAO. Um, monetary policy. So, you know, Christine Lagarde, I think, maybe about two months ago, three months ago, raised the question, how can we effectively use monetary policy in a world where Bitcoin is very big? Right? And finally, the role of the state. So if you look at the history of money, um, any kind of large currency, the state would have always had some kind of involvement. Right? Even uh, for, for you know, in free banking societies, if those of you know what free banking is, the state would have had some kind of role in money creation. A lot of people would say that it's one of the primary powers of the state to control the money. Well, you know, the whole purpose of Bitcoin is designed that nobody can control the money supply, including the state. Right? 
All right, so when you, when you look at this, right, so um, when you look at this, you know, it, it makes sense why financial institutions really wouldn't have given too much thought to Bitcoin until now, particularly if you remember that list of problems that I noted, um, you know, which are the kinds of relevant problems in their, in their purview at the moment. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think Bitcoin is going to start to become pretty hard to ignore if it keeps going on. Um, it's got a lot of momentum, and when you think about the implications of what Bitcoin could do, um, you know, that's, that's a pretty, those are some pretty mind-boggling and difficult, difficult questions in how you're going to deal with them. Anyway, my thesis is, um, it makes sense, you know, the financial institutions haven't given much thought to Bitcoin. My thesis is there's a lot of momentum. Um, unless something drastic happens, I suspect that momentum is going to continue. And the question, what about Bitcoin, is going to start to become pretty relevant to financial institutions. All right. Thank you. I hope I didn't go over time too much. Any questions? Go ahead. Yeah. And the mic. Oh, okay. uh, I would like to know uh, what do you think about uh, Ripple technology, which looks like to be a hybrid between uh, blockchain and uh, shared ledger, because they have at the same time a fixed and cryptocurrency mm -hmm. and uh, the payment infrastructure for uh, institutional. Uh, um, so Ripple is something very different than Bitcoin, right? So Ripple tries to solve a very different kind of problem. I think it's, it's, um, it's basically trying to um, take the next step from Swift, let's say. I don't know if they would, you know, Entirely endorsing, characterizing it that way, but that's how you characterize it. Um, so it's doing something very different than, than Bitcoin. So Ripple is not about uh, Ripple is not per se about sound money in a digital age. Right? Although you can transfer Bitcoin on it and so on, but it's, that's not really what its purpose is. So Ripple is really a specific product targeting certain kinds of use cases. Um, yeah, you know the, the, the retail remittance market and also this. Um, you know, also this uh, 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 this uh, cash market that I was talking about in my example earlier, with all these different bank accounts that have deposits and trying to move that stuff in, in real time. Um, so, for that purpose, it seems to you know it seems it seems to be a pretty good product, right? But it's something very different. of sound digital money. I think you can use the word digital. It is just sound money. And it's exactly the same definition and people will have as well as it. Um, so I, I actually have to disagree with you slightly. Um, <laughs> so it, 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 it's actually somewhat of a, so it, it, it resembles gold, but not exactly, because when you move things to a digital space, you know, it, it, I don't know if it translates uh, exactly, but I understand your point. Okay. Yeah. I reserve my answer. We'll talk to the break time. I'm not entirely sure how to answer. So, I already heard that address, and I think she made the question because in order to have next move, do something, it was like uh, warning. But yep. uh, she, I, I don't think she considers it as a threat. It was just uh, uh, say, saying, uh, do something, move, but not to what we think of knowing. This is my big Yeah. And, and my, my question, and I don't know. Um, so, at the moment, the banks and financial institutions are using permission blockchains yes. for the most part of it. Yes. Um, and I understand why. However, maybe 
we could also use common blockchain, for instance, the Bitcoin blockchain, just for the security that it brings, not for the money. I, yeah, so there, there are, so now we're talking specifically, specifically applications, um, and there might be applications for institutions, for instance, in terms of, you know, time stamping and things like that, for sure. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. yeah that, that was my question as well, why not choose Ethereum and uh, it's now contract for a uh, financial institution? Um, so I didn't really... So I okay. So in my view, everything but Bitcoin is not all that relevant. That's my view. Um, well, why do I think this? Uh, because I think the basic value proposition is sound digital money, and Ethereum does not have that value proposition. Um, there's other reasons why I'm skeptical of, of Ethereum. Uh, what, another one is the complexity of Ethereum. You know, Bitcoin is specifically designed at the bottom to be very simple. Right? That gives it such security. That's not the case in uh, that's not the case in uh, Ethereum. Um, I don't think Ethereum is decentralized in the way that uh, Bitcoin has. Bitcoin has all the network effects. Bitcoin has the infrastructure. Bitcoin is actually by people seen as a store of value and money. Ethers really aren't. Uh, these are some of the reasons why I, in the end, uh, you know, at least when you're talking about the public Ethereum system, which is very different than the private. System, but uh, the public Ethereum system, I'm not as optimistic, uh, not as optimistic, and not just about you know, not just there are you know, I mean there are certain alternative you know projects which which I do find you know interesting things like Monero and so on, and, um, but generally I think uh, Bitcoin is uh, by far the most relevant in this space. But you can certainly use you know. Ethereum, the enterprise version, and financial applications. That's, but that's a whole different story. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, lots. Okay, wow. Okay. Anybody yes. have any questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, what's going to happen after all the coins have been issued? So, I understand that. Yeah. Is it 21 billions of coins? Yes. It's limited. Nothing. <laughs> That's a short answer. Somewhat more elaborate answer. Um, at the moment, the way you know, so you better you better think about when, when, when Satoshi Nakamoto was assigning Bitcoin, he had to solve Bitcoin. He had to solve two problems. One, how do I bring a currency into circulation? And two, how do I incentivize people to mine this stuff and to secure it? Right? And well, you can't just bring the currency into circulation by just dumping it somewhere, right? That, that doesn't really work. And, you know, in order for people to be incentivized, they had to be paid in, in Bitcoin, but transaction fees would not be nearly worth it because, well, Bitcoin wasn't really worth anything when it was launched in 2009. So what he did is he kind of, you know, um, made a curve of new Bitcoins that are created with every block look something like this. And miners are rewarded by this mining reward that goes like this, plus the transaction fees. And its anticipation was, as Bitcoin value grows, the miner fees will be enough to incentivize the security of the Bitcoin network. Right? So what's going to happen when Bitcoin uh, finishes? Uh, if everything works according to plan, it's just going to keep, keep operating in the way that it has. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you discussed the sovereignty in your presentation. Mm -hmm. You've seen the governments will allow Bitcoin and other coins to grow, right? Or at some point, would they create their own cryptocurrencies? The centralized cryptocurrencies? Uh, uh, so, so, centralized cryptocurrencies are an oxymoron, in my opinion. There is no such thing as a centralized cryptocurrency, right? So, what you would be talking about is just a purely digital currency, which isn't all that different, honestly, from how the world works. Uh, because 97% of our currency is already, already digital. Um, would governments allow, you know, would governments allow this? I mean, I think we have experience already with that, right? With some countries uh, banning it, uh, how, how, how well would this work? Yeah, yeah it's, kind of, it's kind of hard to say. One, one of the things that we've noticed with 
you know, Bitcoin companies and so on, they're extremely flexible in where they're located geographically. So, in, in, you know, that's, you know, there's a lot of regulatory arbitrage, let's say. So if one country bans this thing, um, I, I don't think that's going to make much of a difference. I, I think if you wanted to you know, really push, uh, you know, really, really push, uh, push against it, you'd have to see a pretty wide, concerted international effort, and even then, I, I don't really see as that being uh, completely effective. And my guess is, you know. Depends on where you are, but like a country like the Netherlands, I think a lot of people would be very angry <laughs> if you started to do this. And in fact, this might give an incentive for actually actually using it. And particularly now that people from the traditional financial system are also interested in it and starting to use it, I don't really see this as a very very likely uh, scenario. Um, I I don't necessarily see. I mean, is this going to be a you know? Is this going to, if Bitcoin keeps growing in this way, that's going to be you know, it's not going to be a smooth ride by any any stretch of the imagination. But that, you know, in some way, uh, governments are going to try to find a deal, a way to deal with it. I think rather than ban it. But it kind of depends on where you are. Right? But at least you know, Netherlands, France, that's kind of how we see it. Could be one more question? Yes. Actually, you're working for Capgemini, right? Yes. Uh, no, because we was we were expecting for more blockchain policy presentation. <coughs> um, the question is, uh, how do you manage uh, to come with a bit uh, <coughs> presentation when you go to clients when mm -hmm. they were expecting? Uh, Blockchain presentation for, as they say, Serbian smart contract or time okay. um, uh, stamping or stuff like that. So, um, I, I I don't agree with your statement that uh, blockchain is uh, BS. I, I hope I was able to convince you of that uh, reasonably well by giving an example of the kinds of projects, uh, kind of project we do. So, at the end of the day, you know, Kev Gemini hires people like me. <laughs> To think about what's happening in the world and to think about that critically and try to help our clients with that information, right? And so that's what I'm presenting here. What I'm presenting here is this is what's happened so far that makes sense, but we do have this thing called Bitcoin on the horizon, which potentially could grow more, that could potentially be quite important for the world, very important in fact. And so it's my job also to help my clients think about those issues. And sometimes it's well received, sometimes a little bit less well received. My question is pretty related to all the previous ones. You briefly mentioned the monetary policy, and if I'm not mistaken, you use words that the Bitcoin would not be Regulated, would not be. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have any power above it. Mm -hmm. According to the monetary policy, and the fact that actually the money was somebody had the power during all the history of, of the world. Actually, mm -hmm. what do you think about? Can you briefly discuss your vision about the currency over which nobody, literally nobody, has the power? Of? Okay, so. When I was talking about you know all these kinds of things, right? I was kind of still leaving it open about what this world would look like, right? So I, I don't have a clear answer about what Bitcoin success looks like in this kind of world. But I do think that you know the fact that nobody controls Bitcoin really is one of the fundamental values of Bitcoin. So I'm going to assume that if it is successful, that that is the case in the future. How do I how do I think about that? Um, you know, I it's a it's a hard question to to answer. I mean, what you might start seeing um, more of. So, if you think about where we are in our monetary history, we're actually at a pretty pretty unique stage. So, if you look at the 19th century Netherlands, for instance, we would not have used one currency. 
Right? In fact, you would have had five, six, seven different currencies that people use. And the fact that we only generally use one currency is actually atypical from a historical perspective. So um, it's you know it's very it's very much possible that you know in that future world I don't think so. Here's one thing I forgot. Or you know, something drastic would have that. The Bitcoin replaces all other currencies. That would be extremely drastic. I, I don't know what kind of catastrophe would have to happen for that to be the case. Right? But it, it probably will coexist in a competitive environment with um, other kinds of currencies. But you know, these kinds of currencies might be more constrained in the kinds of monetary policies that they can they can execute in the, you know, the Bitcoin world. I don't know if that really, does that, does that answer the question, kind of, I'm not sure I entirely understood it. Yeah, exactly. It, like, my question primarily was about the vision of the world which we have a currency which everybody uses, but actually nobody has control of it. So you've been talking about the vision of multi-currency world, so the currency which we like, currently know, mm -hmm. uh, and the government obviously Mm -hmm. Has some control over it, especially the interest rates, the borrowing. Sure. But you're presenting some kind of vision of the SMEFs, like the market totally regulating itself. Nobody controlling the market. So, actually, my question was if you're not believing, if you currently believe that the, the world will be in some kind of coalition between the current currencies, the Bitcoin, mm -hmm. how is it going to manage? The currency which are regulated by government, the currency which definitely is not. How can you create a vision about dual, you know, the, the dual coexistence? This kind of stuff. So, so why do I think it's possible that they can coexist? Um, well, like I said, right, historically it's not that atypical for many different currencies to coexist, uh, coexist with each other, right? But if you, I do think, so let me, let me at least make this statement, so I do think in that kind of world, Bitcoin will exert certain other, you know, certain kinds of pressures on, let's say, you know, uh, government regulated currencies, right, in terms of uh, printing them and, and, and so on. Um, and just because some, you know, there are, uh, you know, there are potentially also advantages, it's not like one currency maybe is, you know, the complete advantage in terms of the landscape compared to others. It may be that certain kinds of currencies have certain kinds of different advantages, right? And some people are probably going to be, you know, gravitated towards one and some towards gravitated towards the other. So, I, you know, the idea of a competitive landscape for currencies, I think, is a, is a pretty, pretty plausible. Okay, cool. Thank you for that great presentation and Q&A. Um, we've got about 10, 15 minute break. We've got pizza and soft drinks, and if you need beer, you, know, you, gotta, you can buy some beer at the, uh, the bar. So, feel free to begin. Uh, can you tell them to accept Bitcoin because they don't take credit card? Yeah. 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 Yeah.